uh, I'm Jonathan, uh, Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am one of the co-chairs uh, with Katie Nickel Baines of the Staff Pride Network. The Staff Pride Network is uh, for LGBT plus colleagues and allies at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we organise events and provide uh, various levels of support for um, members and the wider university from survey inquiries to uh, how to uh, improve their policies. Um, we are delighted on International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia uh, to have uh, Heather and Nicola with us and to introduce them, uh, I will pass you over to our social and events officer, Sarah Barnard. Thanks very much, Jonathan. As I mentioned, my name is Sarah Barnard. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm the social and events officer for the Staff Pride Network. Um, so we're presenting this event today on Ida Hobbit or Ida Hoblet um, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. I see it the other in the, in the other um, order sometimes, but then that doesn't make the acronym. It's, anyway, the theme is Our Bodies, Our Lives, Our Rights. And we are really delighted to be hearing from Nicola and Heather today, um, who will be talking about their experience of becoming and being gay parents and some of the challenges, microaggressions and discrimination they've sometimes faced, but also some of the unexpectedly awesome parts of being part of a less traditional rainbow family. Nicola Osborne is the Programme Manager for Creative Informatics and from June Manager for the Institute of Design Informatics and her partner Heather Mikowski is Practice and Partnerships Lead for the Centre for Homelessness Impact and as you may have gathered they are parents and that is what they're going to talk about although who knows maybe some informatics information will filter its way in <laughs> it seems more likely it will be kind of blue tits and or Eurovision. Um, I can always chat about homelessness policy too. If you just homeless <laughs> policy too, yeah. I wanted to say the word informatics because it's a fun word, not to kind of it do down your, your professional experience. <laughs> Apologies. Anyway, so I, I don't kind of um, step in any more of it. Uh, I'll, I'll let Nicola and Heather introduce themselves and go ahead and tell us their insights. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Nicola. Um, in terms of pronouns, she, her. Um, Heather, don't she? Stop. Hi there, I'm Heather and um, my pronouns are she, her. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of split what to say into sort of three different areas, I guess. So kind of where we started from sort of before and then the whole kind of pregnancy during having maybe sort of process and then afterwards. Um, I think we're happy to have questions at any point, but there'll be there'll be time at the end for those anyway. Um, so what should we start with? Should we start with kind of uh, us deciding to actually have have children? Because originally I was a bit skeptical about whether I wanted to have children. You yeah. You weren't. <laughs> I wasn't and and it yeah, I I wanted to have children and um and yeah wanted to give birth um and so so that was something that i wanted to do um and we we looked we sort of looked through various options and yeah. and what the process could be and and things and and i think it it sort of um years and years ago there was um there was an event for prospective parents um run by the lgbt um LGBT Health Centre yeah. um, in Edinburgh, and um, they it was it was the great event, um, and you know it was really great that there was someone from Edinburgh Council there talking about fostering and adoption. Um, there was someone from a private um, clinic there talking about what the the process is for them. And and I think what what was sort of disappointing and somewhat surprising was that there was a there was a statement from NHS Lothian, yeah. um, and this was years and years ago, and, they, and they've changed their policy since. But um, effectively, the statement said, um, "We don't discriminate. We don't discriminate, but um, but we will not provide any fertility treatment for same-sex couples." Um, and by the way, it's really unsafe to do this on your own. Yeah. 
Um, so we we wouldn't recommend that at all. Yeah. So that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do some options. Um, and but it was a useful event for kind of just having us then think about it. And there were some useful hecklers at that event who were like, we just did it ourselves. It's fine. Just do that. And that kind of planted the seed of that's an option. That sounds like an affordable option that might be doable. Um, and then there was like a lot of discussion about who we would find to be a donor because we both really wanted an own donor for I think quite like for slightly different reasons so um for me my dad died when I was very young and I thought it was really important that whatever child we have gets to know all of their parents and they have other people that they can connect with and that was really really important to me it was really important for you as well that we have an own donor um and that that also was quite difficult to do with like private providers and quite difficult well not impossible to do with the NHS then and now I think yeah. um so, so it got to a point where we did actually like do the awkward thing of asking the friends that we thought would be a really amazing donor. Cause I had a friend from, I mean, both of our friends, but um, uh, someone I'd, I knew from university uh, for a long time. And we'd have one of those conversations a very long time ago before I knew I wanted children at all, um, where it had been a bit like, well, if you ever want to have children, and I was like, yeah, but I won't, but okay, noted. And then it was like, oh, okay, it's been almost 20 years. Uh, should we write a letter? Um, so we, we sent a whole letter to explaining what we thought the setup might be and that we wanted a known donor, but not necessarily people who were kind of parenting with us all the time. And yeah, yeah, sort of trying to explain what, what we thought we needed and would they be up for it? And yeah, sorry, Kuna. It, yeah. And I, I mean, just sort of saying that, you know, lots of people have sort of different hopes and, and expectations and, and it wasn't that we were you know against any sort of co-parenting or anything but the practicalities of it that um the person is in london so um you know we we wanted to make it clear this would be very open and you know we would continue to see them very often yeah um but you know we weren't sort of looking for any for them to be to step in as a parent yeah. and we're going to require um, anything of them yeah. that they didn't want to give but they could be as involved as they wanted to be anyway it, delightedly they said yes which was fantastic and um and our donor's, our donor's gay and his partner is trans and so it's already a very rainbow family to sort of set up to start with so we had lots of very honest conversations they came up and we had a whole like they had questions and we we had conversations and talked a lot we um and around so to see what helpful advice you might have which was interesting um just to sort of check in on things like because you can get your fertility checked although it's pretty crude um our, our donors gp was actually really helpful um and sort of did the appropriate checks and things and was like good luck our gp was a little bit more clueless our, um, our gp yeah was was not not that helpful and and gave well gave, gave the gave the standard um the standard advice which is um that you should just have sex every few days yeah um, well, and, I, and we yeah. politely explained that that wasn't going to work thank you very much and, and also not really um, how fertility and, works through a month because yeah um, and and so yeah she it it was it was really clear that that um if we had had any trouble that the NHS wouldn't be a possibility for us. And there were various reasons for that. Um, and, and, you know, what, one of which is that they have a, a, a BMI requirement um, that I did meet um, for um, intrauterine insemination, but not for IVF. And even though I didn't want a medicalized process, didn't really want IVF. They would only refer you through the system if it was on the route to IVF. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and and there were various requirements about how long you had to try before you were you're, referred on. You're supposed to have had plenty of attempts. Didn't which... really seem yeah. um, to fit with <laughs> with the, who we were. They're very set up um, for like you know what your fertility level is because they're assuming it's straight couples. So there's just no way of kind of going like I don't know. I've never been in a situation where there's any possibility of an unplanned pregnancy. So no idea what the fertility looks like in any way. Um, so yeah, it was it's just a bit of a funny um, setup. They have improved a lot to be fair since our experience, which was not very long ago because our, our daughter's four. So this is probably about six years ago. We were having these conversations. But they've changed their policy quite significantly.
in fairness. Um, so, I mean, that that all said, um, once we were successful, they um, were, very good. were were amazing. Um, and, you know, you, sort of everything that you hear about NHS midwives is true and they're wonderful. Yeah. Um, and 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 there were sort of there were wonderful and very well intentioned um, oh God, it was hilarious. um ways that they included nicola um but that were slightly ridiculous at the same time so so when um when you when you you know first go in for your first appointment they um they take a whole you know medical history and ask you about you yeah. know your family and and any you know any genetic um things they should be looking for and things like that and they and they do that for for both parents um and and it was it was really nice that they started asking nicola it's, it's very like, awkward it's very awkward because some of them are sort of family history questions some of them are sort of more are you more a smoker or a drink or something so it was like okay for that question i'll answer it for this one i'll give you my best guess knowing my donor very very well but not actually being the donor, it was very sweet. It was, it was very the opposite of description. It was like, I've been so included that they've forgotten that I don't have any genetic material in the mix. Um, but it was, it was really sweet. Um, yeah, I see a question about sort of uh, timeframes and things. It, so it was five and a half years ago, probably going to change, but it had, a, yeah. it had a major change in policy a year or so after that, not very long after that. Yeah. Um, overdue, I think. Um, I mean, I, so we didn't talk much about the, the processy bit and I will I will quickly sort of touch on that. So when we decided we were going to do stuff ourselves, we had like really honest chats with our, our wonderful donor and his partner. Um, we found the Stonewall Guide for, for Lesbian Princes, which has been around for like 10 years, I think. So useful, so, so kind of clear and straightforward and useful and just downloaded that. Um, there was actually a kind of a, an article that Sandy Toxbig wrote for like the Sunday Times about 15, 20 years ago, I remember reading as a teenager and stuck with me. And I hadn't realized how useful that was until I read the Stonewall Guide. And I was like, oh yeah, this is bringing up memories of reading that article. Um, and there were a couple of websites and stuff that were really useful. So once we figured out kind of what, what kind of kit and process we needed, um, that was very helpful. Had to buy things in crazy bulk because it's quite hard to buy like needleless syringes in less than a hundred. So when we actually were successful, we found ourselves with some very weird stuff to try and get rid of. So it's fine. Cat rescues yeah. really like uh, needleless syringes. They're good for feeding kittens. Yeah, apparently. it was good to have a use for them. <laughs> um, and it did, it did take us a bunch of goes. So we tried to make it like a, a fun like our, our donors are in London. So it was like, well, we had lots of weekend trips down to London. Um, I think, I think actually the successful trip, technically I was down for a work conference. So it was uh, partly subsidized by work. <laughs> um, but, but it was, it, yeah, it was, it was really a, sort of a nice thing to try to make it as stress free as possible. And it was, it was brilliant that it was successful. And it, yeah, maybe six or seven kind of trips and multiple goes and stuff, um, but totally, totally doable so like i think a lot of the time the advice that's given out is a bit like one of the reasons they say don't use known donors is that like it was very very unsafe which is very frustrating from a kind of discriminatory point of view because they don't run around telling sort of straight couples to like you know monitor all of the activities of their partner because it could be very unsafe if their partner's been up to it you know i don't know it, they, they just it seems very double standardy um but uh yeah anyway it, it, it can make it seem quite like it's difficult to to do and in our experience it was it was not quick and it wasn't straightforward but it was it was absolutely fine and the friends we went into this whole process with were very very trusted very close very honest like friends as well who will tell us things if they're not happy you know um and that that made it all kind of doable to have funny little ex exchanges of little cups and things in hotels and things um but yeah so it was it was just it was a fine process actually <laughs> um oh uh, so someone was asking what our relationship was to the donor point really really close friends so i mean they they definitely are family now but they always felt like family like it was someone who had um uh come come home with me for Christmas a couple of times. Um, I think my granny would have quite liked it if I'd gotten married to him, which definitely was not on the cards in any way, shape or form. But he was a really close friend to both of us and his partner yeah. had become a really close friend of both of us as well when they when they got together. Um, and so they were just really, really close friends who we knew kind of wanted children as well. Um, and who we, we thought would tell us right away if they weren't up for it. Because um, we, did, we did talk about, we've got a lot of,
friends who don't have children, which is unusual, I think. Like a lot of our straight friends don't have children. And we did talk a bit about like, are, there, are there other people who we should be approaching that we know? And and we sort of talked through like, well, actually, I think we these are people we should start with. And if that doesn't work out, then we'll discuss it further. But like, it's quite a disruptive force to someone else's relationship, potentially, if they're both not bought in in the same way. And yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's a weird conversation to have about your friends. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's been it's been really it's been really lovely, it um, and it has meant that um, our daughter Karis has just so much family, a much wider extended family than than anyone else, yeah. um, because she has, you know, she has us and and our and your parents uh, and, and our my parents own. yeah and. Um, and then our donor and his partner and their parents and you know it's just sort of this lovely extended family yeah. of of people who really care about her it, it um, was it was really and sweet that's something yeah. that, that was really important to us um yeah and and one of the reasons why we really wanted a known donor yeah. rather than um than someone anonymous yeah yeah because neither of us have like massive massive families and yeah that was really important Just, it was really sweet how um how our donors so our donors uh, parents passed away but he's got some other family that we we've met um and uh his partner has um his mum his mum has a female partner and he has a dad and his dad has a female partner as well. So she has crazy numbers of grandmas. Um, but they were very sweet about how they might get involved. So they were really excited but didn't want to impose on our space and were really sweet about it. So it's saying like, oh, we'd, we'd like to be supportive. And they're like sending us brownies and stuff when she was born. And, and for me, like, we don't want to impose, but if you have any pictures, we're like, no, no, this is delightful. So it's now got to a place where everyone, everyone knows how involved everyone wants to be. So we have... I don't know how many WhatsApp groups where they get kind of regular updates of little pictures of Karis and updates and how she's doing and everything. And it's but but even like during the pregnancy and stuff, they were kind of very tentatively like wanting to be involved but not not wanting to step on her toes. And it was it was really sweet. So there's a question that's come through about the legal limitations with the known donor. So it's actually um, if if you are in a civil partnership or you are married, um, then it's really straightforward. Um, so the the assumption is that um, you're if 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 you're the birth parent, then your partner will be the other parent yeah. on the birth certificate. It was and, super and that, that that will be so parental rights will be shared between you right from the beginning. Um, if you are not in a civil partnership or married, um, then it's a little bit more complicated and potentially the donor could um, have a right claim parental rights over um, over the child um, so you can do you know legal paperwork paperwork yeah. with a solicitor um, but if if you are in a civil partnership it, or or married it's it's really incredibly straightforward um, and, from a legal point and of view i think for us one of the ways that we wanted to make sure there was some legal connection in a way that was important was just writing wills in case something happens to the pair of us which is obviously always in in my mind because of because of my dad um so we've got it set up so that any if something would happen to both of us then Karis would be getting taken care of by by her dad's essentially in London um and and our stuff would be held in trust and my sister would be part of that and so it just kind of uh it makes it formal so that they wouldn't have any risk of losing that connection because they're they're involved and they're engaged now but and that's important to us and the only circumstance I can see that changing would be if, if something happened to us and it wasn't clearly written down somewhere. So our wills reflect the legal relationship we'd want to make sure is continued, um, that reflects the kind of social relationship that isn't formal, I guess, that we have at the moment. Um, so that's the only kind of legal paperwork we we did in that direction. Um, but it is, yeah, it is quite straightforward because our daughter is a joint citizen, like US and UK, the US paperwork's a little bit different. Um, so we had quite a funny moment registering her birth with the U.S. consulate. So yeah, so so U.S. Um, citizenship can be passed down in two ways. Um, you can either be born in the U.S., in which case you're automatically a citizen, or if you have a parent who has um, U.S. citizenship. Um, and so, yeah, because. <laughs>
it it was slightly it was completely unnecessary because i have u.s citizenship and i was on her birth certificate as the mother um so they didn't need to ask us any of these questions but they did anyway yeah. because there's a form to fill in um so so they you know they they do ask questions about um about the who the father is and you know well they ask questions about whether it if, wasn't conceived naturally if you are in a same-sex relationship then they ask questions about where the you know how, where the, 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 how the baby was conceived yeah um, whether there was medical intervention. If there was medical intervention, then they ask you all sorts of questions about, yeah. you know, other Yeah, so we, we filled in and we're like, um, so there wasn't a medical intervention? And we made this awkward chat at the booth where it was like, so this is what happened, and this is how we did this. And the desk was like, and, and that worked? And we were like, yeah. And she was like, great job. And then she was like, I'm going to fill in this form a little bit differently. <laughs> just so that it's easy to process in case you do it again um here's your form take it back with you but it was it was just quite a funny sort of yeah it was it was set up for like only only one set of, of, of processes but yeah um i realize we sort of skipped ahead a bit and haven't talked much about sort of some of the like during the pregnancy stuff which i think in terms of some of the the strange world of heteronormative parenting was a bit of an eye-opener um so we talked a bit about the midwives and things but um uh, oh, there's a, oh, hang on, there's a question. Um, uh, following up that question, are there any legal discrepancies for the non-biological parent compared to the biological one, either during the process or potentially afterwards in unforeseen events, e.g. divorce? Uh, would you happen to know if you could also depend on gender as well, e.g. two girls compared to two mothers? Um, I think in terms of the differences between biological and non-biological, I think not. Once it's all registered, certainly, like like Heather was saying, we're, we're in sole partnership, we've both registered as the legal parents of the child. So... That would work the same way as any traditional couple, I guess, in terms of rights and things in the event of divorce, which is more complex if you are not together but you break up. And I'm, you know, I know of circumstances where that's sort of quite awkward in terms of um, access. You're not together, but that would apply as well to, you know, anyone not registered as the birth parent in, in other kind of cases. In terms of the sort of two mothers, two fathers rather than two mothers, that's probably a little bit different just because of kind of biological element i mean it. i suppose it's a little bit different because i think birth certificates will still say um they'll they'll have the mother listed um as the mother and then it will say father slash other parent yeah um so th those two roles will have equal roles and responsibilities yeah. um those two labels um but um it means if if you're a biological, if you're if you're someone who is born male, um, and and two men who are who are born male, um, then yeah, I don't actually know. They won't be on the birth certificate. <laughs> At the end of the, they they yeah. won't because because they won't be able to register the birth. Yeah. So so that would require um I, I a, an adoption. I don't know anything about no. um sort of surrogacy, and so I couldn't answer that. Um, I think if it was two male adoptive parents, it would start to look more the same again because it would be just the two parents who are the adoptive parents. And I, I'm sure yeah. there is a straight process for it, but I'm aware of the fact that we're, that's, we we don't know. So I wouldn't want to give but, any inappropriate but advice. If, but if it's an adoption, then yeah. there there will be space for two parents. Um, yeah. They will be labelled in probably the same way. I know there have been yeah. some cases um, in in England um, about uh, uh, the the man who was pregnant um yes uh, the, trans the trans man who was pregnant um and and he tried and i think failed in the court so far um to have you know mother taken off um of birth certificates yeah um, so so far no luck on that yeah um but yeah yeah in terms of adoptive parents it it the rights for both parents will be the same yeah um yeah. So anyway, so I was going to say a bit about some of the some of the antenatal classes and some of the expectations in those, which was like, I don't think either of us like we have lo we have loads of more straight friends than gay friends, I think probably, um, but we don't spend a lot of time in like super heteronormative unfeminist spaces, and the antenatal classes were a very strange like <laughs> awakening to the world of default parent mode, which is very straight. Um, so the the entity classes we went to national childbirth trust class we went to they weren't too bad uh, mm -hmm. but occasionally they'd break into like gendered groups sort of 
<laughs> it's one of the lesbian couples. Really yes, helpful, of, of eight couples, there was one of there one was of the lesbian so, couple. so it was a quarter, um, you know, lesbian couples. Yeah. Um, and so yes, it made the gendered groups um, quite funny, slightly different. Yeah, than probably is more the norm. Yeah. So there were, there were an odd few comments in the kind of gender groups where myself and the other non-birth parent in those groups would give each other a look like um because it was like a slightly slightly odd gendered space but they were not too bad but the nhs ones were quite extraordinary the the daily schedule is the is the class i remember most clearly um which is extraordinary it was quite astonishing so i mean i i I, i'm sure they still do this exercise um but they had all of these little laminated cards that it was like this is what your daily schedule might look like after you have a baby and and you know it, it had all of these tasks and stuff and then you could assign the tasks for what time of day so you have to feed the baby every two hours um and and you have to put on the washing and you have to make dinner and you have to somehow, I think there was make your partner breakfast. I yes. swear to God, there was make, make your, your partner, partner breakfast. Yeah. And do the laundry, and, do the cleaning of the house. And I just house. sat there looking at this list going, first off, I'm, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make dinner every day. <laughs> like, and I'm certainly not going to make Nicola breakfast every morning. <laughs> um, no. And, and then, and then some of the, you know, so we, so we go through this exercise and some of their suggestions were, well, you could have your mum come over yeah. and help you. And I'm going, yeah, She's but. She's in California. Or, or not, or Nicola could do this. Yeah, it was, it was so weird. It was such a weird thing. As it was, the classes, they required both parties to sign up anywhere, like both partners. And like a lot of the partners had disappeared by like weeks three and four um but yeah it was like oh well you can ask your mother to help with things also oh the mother-in-law arrives like uninvited we're like well firstly that's not going to happen because she's in wales um <laughs> and also secondly if she did that she would get a shrift telling off and sent off to a hotel like uh, you know it's it's a very weird sort of 1950s landscape in their sort of day and it was a very strange contrast because as we said the midwives individually to us and in all of our encounters with them for appointments and and medical stuff were brilliant but some of the kind of default sort of manual of how to introduce people into the world of being parents was very odd. And there was no expectation of even paternity leave, let alone shared parental leave in their kind of structure of who does what around the house. And it doesn't reflect like most of the straight couples that I know, let alone yeah. like queer couples that we know. So it was quite peculiar. And I did sit there in the room feeling a bit, it, it yeah, it felt like you walked into some kind of cult that you didn't want to join. <laughs> um, but I mean, like I said, the midwives themselves were actually very nice. Um, I think, uh, so I mentioned potentially even shared parental leave, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was shared parental leave, because I think, um, uh, <laughs> yes, I can see the comment. Uh, yeah, no, the, to- <laughs> the thing about making dinner and making breakfast are totally bizarre, because it's completely bizarre. And there's ideas of what the support structures were as well. I kind of, I think, assumed everyone was living near their home and near their family and that they had lots of other friends who also have small children and that there'd be all of these other mothers they'd be hanging out with and we live in the middle of the city with lots of friends who don't have children but who are very helpful um it just it's a different universe i think but it's this was an edinburgh group so it wasn't like we were seeing people living in like little villages or anything so you better say something no no um so I was going to mention shared parental leave because I know one of the things that was a, a bit of a, a trigger for asking us to do this was was partly that I'd written an article for the bulletin about um, taking Aww. shared parental leave. This is our small child. <laughs> Karis, do you want to say hello? No, no. <laughs> um, was that when I went to book shared parental leave because I'd seen that there was a really good policy for it. The university has like 18 weeks of fully paid leave, which is amazing. Um, and at the time, uh, Heather's working somewhere else and their policies on on maternity leave were not particularly generous like financially so it would seem insane not to take a really good um break and i wanted to be like meet our daughter and and be a proper co-parent um as incompetent as i was at times during shared parental leave um and when we should put the request in their policy was that you could take the 18 weeks but only during the first only during the six first months? six months yeah so at a period when she would be tiny and breastfeeding and when heather would be on maternity leave so it kind of assumes that I was doing this as top up to paternity leave or or that we'd both be off and it didn't it wasn't restructured really in a way where Heather could be off for six months and then I could take time off 
and then we'd both be at home for a good period of time well it was you just wouldn't have been paid (laughs) yes that's true i could have taken it but not paid so i kind of made trouble um and was thankfully supported by some hr colleagues who were like do you want to make trouble and i was like yes please and i put in a freedom of information request to find out how people had taken shared parental leave to find that very few people had taken any shared parental leave and a lot of them had just taken like a few weeks as kind of top up for paternity leave and it was just i was going through the same time as some male colleagues were also having partners having babies and it was just it was fascinating the kind of expectations of, of what they might do with that time and uh, the idea that they might take care of their kids on their own some of them was a bit alienating um not all of them and i'm aware that lots of people have taken parental leave now and i'm really pleased that's had more pickup um so I, they were putting through they wanted to put through a change of policy anyway um and i put in some letters and things to help with a here's someone asking for this um and so i was very pleased the policy was changed by the time i needed to take share parental leave and therefore got to do that um but it was that was also quite an insight into the sort of just people not challenging the status quo very much i guess um and at, at the point that we had our daughter the other first people we knew who'd taken shared parental leave were the other lesbian couple in our nct group none of the other uh parents in our nct group were taking shared parental leave which was just a bit telling um yeah but it, it's a it's it's a wonderful thing it's and, awesome and it's a wonderful offer um that the university has yeah. for um for parents um and, and they are now um, sort of leading the way with um, offering a, a generous um, shared parental leave pay um, that can be taken at any point in the first year. Yeah. Um, or maybe the first nine months. I don't and, know. And all the people who take taken it, it was an article about and, a lot of the men who'd taken it that triggered me to write the article for Bulletin because I just felt like they weren't representing queer parents in that mix. Um, and that, that was and, important. And it was, you know, financially for us, it was an absolute no brainer yeah. um, because I was in a different role at the time um, and on statutory um, uh, maternity leave, which is great that it exists, but. Um, I think you know what 180 pounds a week yes. is um not great to live on yeah. um so um so you know six months of that was great Quite enough. <laughs> um, but but we couldn't have afforded um yeah. for for me to be off work for um for a full year yeah um, whereas together all. we're able to then take off like sort of 10 months and our daughter started nursery and that loved it which was was great um it was quite interesting because they were introduced the show parental leave was quite new and so when we were starting to have the conversation about having kids was about the time that they were starting to roll out shared parental leave and i had an interesting like conversation with some colleagues who were advertising some events who were like this is an event for fathers and i was like is it an event for fathers or is it an event for people who are the partners of people who are having babies um and they were a bit weird about it i was like no no I explicitly just want to know, am I included in this event or not? And so they eventually kind of updated the advertising for it to be like non-birth parents or, or something, which I just suggested is like a, maybe that helps explain it better. Um, and then got a bit grumpy, I think, when they didn't have quite as much turnout. Though I think if it said fathers, we'd had more turnout. And we'd be like, really? Um, and that that's one of those, again, one of those things where it's just like, oh, okay, I, it seems depressing that the guys wouldn't show up for it if it's framed in a way that's inclusive of, a wider group of people um and also that the event they hadn't really thought through the kind of that there might be other kinds of parents out there um and again i think they have improved a lot how they communicate around that and it was very well intentioned that they had the event at all um but yeah it's been a sort of because there are lots of little heteronormative spaces there's just been a lot of just occasionally going i'll just i'll just update the pronoun there i'll just update the label for that um yeah which has reminded me one of our one of our tips about uh your labeling of what you're going to be called by your child um uh, <laughs> which is uh may, maybe think about that before before your child has decided for themselves what they're going to call you um yes yes because i'm mummy and and nicola's other mummy yes um so which is which is great um and, no one else is called other mommy it's unique in the world and she has a lot of friends who um who will tell their mums that they want an other mummy too yes. Yes. <laughs> um, mostly when they're mad at their mums yes um, there's a whole bunch of people in nursery who will call me other mummy which is quite disconcerting <laughs> if you wear the labels um yeah so i guess um the other the other kind of portion i guess of what we'd we'd sort of noted down was talk a bit about 
just just being a parent out in the world and i have to say the the being a parent bit has been like mostly fine actually i think it's been where more of the awesome stuff are sat rather than the um the weird little mini discriminatory thingies i think i think you know the worst point for some of those things was probably having those conversations where the spaces are just so long and established and designed for straight couples and stuff the health visitors were great they also asked me for my medical history <laughs> hey ho um there are also things that are really nice support structures designed for new mums like um like peep which is a uh sort of council run sort of support group really but it's just a sort of you go along once a week at lunchtime that you, that tends to be a bit kind of or default straight sort of set up but again it's run by people who are super nice and super inclusive so although it's sort of the activities feel a bit standardized um the actual kind of support was really lovely and i you know i i find so friendly quite quite challenging looking after small children it's never come very naturally to me um and they were very nice to me when i really needed it <laughs> um yeah but just yeah lots of quiet assumptions ed everywhere but never usually in a kind of problematic way and nursery's been amazing hasn't it yeah yeah our nursery has um never been um anything but uh welcoming they've never they've never made any big deal um out of any setup no. the the forms are actually i've totally never neutral. even sort of yeah. you know the forms are really neutral so you know i've not had to cross off father um um they you know they send home two mother's day cards scribbles really sweet. um and and no father's day cards they you know they they just sort of do this and we don't have to say anything no. um and yeah we know some other parents who's whose nursery's been quite good about asking them for like book recommendations and things to have inclusive books and things it's like i haven't heard of in, in the very small cluster of, of, of queer parents that we know who've had this conversation with, that's been actually very positive from experiences and other parents and stuff have been super nice. I mean, I guess it's probably a very middle class set of parents that we hang with because they're all sending their kids to nursery. Um, but no one's been remotely odd. There's never been any kind of misgenderings or assumptions or anything like that. Small children are just weird because we're small children will kind of like throw all kinds of wacky labels at you. So sometimes we have little role plays where I get called dad. Uh, but that's fine. I don't really mind. Um, and yeah, it's 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 been mostly just very very positive. Actually, I'm trying to I'm I'm, I'm not thinking of anything that's particularly been a sort of negative thing. It's just that in a lot of spaces, there's just a casual assumption that there's a mum and a dad, and then you just correct them, and everything's fine. Um, but yeah, um, should so, we stop talking yeah. and see if there are questions? We would love questions. <laughs> Our small heckler has run away. <laughs> I think one thing that I'm very aware of is that like our experience is our experience and everyone does their set it their own way. And we know lots of yeah. like lesbian mums and queer mums that have done the, the NHS process and had a positive experience of it or have had um, particularly more recently had a positive experience of it and have used the sort of donor catalogue that are almost always Danish. Fun fact, almost all sperm donors seem to be Danish um in the uk because if the the they changed the regulations about having anonymous donors in the uk and so a lot of the donor pool just dried up and so they buy in sperm from denmark um but anyway they've had really positive experience and have lovely children and things so we know that that process can be really positive yeah. for, for a lot of people um but our process we're delighted worked out and yeah worked well um oh i can see a question in the q a rather than the chat so okay. um what tips would you give as a non-birth parent in terms of bonding with a new baby? One of the things my wife is most nervous about. Um, oh, that's a really good question. So uh, I think just just kind of like holding your baby and engaging with your baby. Um, I think it's very it's very easy to like to love your new baby when it's born. It's it's it's, it's not difficult. It is sometimes difficult to get it like the initial space when when Heather when like was in labour. So Heather went into labour during the massive snowstorm in 2018, which was extraordinary and extreme. And um, 
uh, I definitely got treated better by the midwives, by the way, than the male par co-parents. <laughs> it was very sweet because it's a very female centered space and they just are just automatically used to like looking after women so well. Um, but uh, it, it was very weird because we spent this very intense day and a half, I think, in the kind of labor ward and then Heather gave birth and that was wonderful. And I stayed with her for a little bit, but then once you've had the baby, you know, Heather was taken off to, um, so you had a bit of an infection. So you went into the high dependency unit where you can't stay as a partner. And on the ward, you also like can't stay as a partner. So I then had to go home. And so I had this very weird, I, I mean, they let me have a couple of hours of sleep in the nurse's lounge, which is where I got very much better treated than the boys that were in at the same time. Cause a couple of other couples went into labor that we know at the same time. Um, but I came home and like made myself a big dinner and sat watching wildlife documentaries in floods of tears going, that was a very big moment. I feel like I should be with my new baby. Um, it was, it was very odd. And I think they're getting a bit better than that um, about what they do with kind of um, parents. I think they, our friends who most recently had a baby had a better experience than that, but um, that, that wouldn't just apply to queer parents. That would be to any kind of co-parent. Um, but I think just, just get involved and, and engage with your baby and, our baby didn't like Harris was not into having any kind of bottle feeding. So even if you express milk and I tried to feed it, that didn't work very well. Um, but there are other ways to bond. And I think especially as she gets like older and chatty and has her own little personality, it's even easier to bond. Like when she was very new and I first went on shared parental leave, it was, it was much more challenging, but I'm really glad I took that time because that was really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just, you know, take, take the, take the, paternity leave that it's still called yeah um take take as, much of, people. <laughs> take as much of that take annual leave around there just spend spend a lot of time um and and the first you know the first few weeks and months are just a lot of sitting on the sofa um yeah um i love this question have you had any negative or ambiguous experiences from relatives and how have you exploited the crazy number of grandparents i hope i've not misquoted you you've not misquoted us we have a crazy number of grandparents um <laughs> i think the relatives have all been fantastic so uh, your parents were just totally cool um my mother's first question was like who's the father and then was like it was just quite no funny. her first question was are oh, you sorry. moving house are you moving house <laughs> who's the father is your sister gonna have a baby those were her three questions <laughs> um so they were like invasive but they weren't no and she's been super excited and quite often she's she's quite funny she's quite often quite often it's like wish you were my mum's um which is very sweet um yeah so they've been really lovely um our donors partners parents are have been so sweet like i said so respectful of giving us space um it, it's been it, yeah I, I i think i don't know what i like i don't know what my dad would have made of it my dad was Catholic, I have no idea. Maybe I suspect it would have been fine though, because my parents growing up, I remember them having queer friends who would visit us, and I didn't realise until really recently how unusual that is in terms of feeling safe and supported. Um, and your parents the same, actually. Um, and uh, in terms of like the various grandparents and stuff, no, I mean they've they've only felt like really positive things. And other members of the family, like aunts and right. uncles and stuff, that are I wouldn't have expected to be as chill, have been totally totally lovely we've been very lucky but you've missed Karis gets lots of presents that's true that's <laughs> <laughs> she does get spoiled to pieces yes um yes yes Christmas is a bit of an epic uh bonanza um and it does mean that like all of our all of our travel is basically to visit relatives uh, who need to see how Karis is doing but like genuinely every every morning when she was like tiny we would send a picture out to like all these different whatsapp groups so everyone could see how she was doing and and some of the grandparents who'd been a bit quieter about coming forward like started to ask more often for things and it was really lovely when they started and it's like no that's fine just tell us that you want to see us what that's totally fine so it's, it's only been really lovely um there's a question about asking for any book or resource recommendations for prospective queer parents um i can see john's gonna answer that hey thank you <laughs> no i think i think you just saying that's gonna be answered that's fine um so that Stonewall guide was real useful, like really useful. Um, I don't know. We haven't really read a whole bunch of books. I don't think that's been. No, I don't. I like think advice books. No, my my sister sent lots of <laughs> mothering advice <laughs> books that we just avoided. There, there are lots out there. They're just not for me. <laughs> we don't, neither of us take advice well, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think I know that there are lots of books and resources and things and. 
um yeah the stonewall garb is really really good uh the first place we got like kit from was a place called pride angel and that was quite a useful website as well as the kit we got but there's loads of other places like that um i think probably the lgbt center for health and well-being would have some of those resources as well uh, and they're really lovely to deal with down, down in leith um yeah we didn't we didn't do a lot of bookishy stuff the thing we did do is all the stuff that you need to, so you know at the beginning um sarah was saying like oh we're even getting matics in there um i mean data was big for us so the things we did do behind the scenes was a lot of like tracking our cycle um a lot of like data collection so we could see what was going on um so there was a lot of trying to be quite you know clever and plotting about that sort of stuff but that was just reading general kind of pregnancy advice things yeah. and using kind of fertility tracking apps and the same stuff that anyone who is trying to get pregnant might be using um so some of those resources were useful anyway um yeah but we didn't yeah we didn't do a lot of book stuff no but we have gotten we've gotten some books for carers yeah um so there's a there's a great one that's um a really recent book i think it was just released in the summer called pirate mums which is oh, so cute which is really adorable it's um it's about a boy or girl i don't know i don't remember a little child a, ch a school age child yeah. um who has two mums um who are, pirates. who are pirates who has two pirate mums and they go on a school trip on a boat and the the child is kind of embarrassed by their pirate mums because they're pirates yes um until the pirate mums you know save the day on this boat yeah and and then you know the child is bought in on the pirates yeah um and it's just lovely because it's you know the the it makes no deal about um, the two moms. It's that they're pirates. Yeah. <laughs> that is the um, that is the you know cringeworthy bit for for this child. Um, yeah. And so you know we get her these to read and and just sort of books that show her all different types of families and and all uh, different types of children. So Jeremy and, is a mermaid. The one we got the other week. Um, no, Julian. Julian. Is, Julian is a mermaid. Is another um, really lovely, sweet book lovely book that is just quietly demonstrative of um of what different people look like yeah um, different yeah non non-binary gender definitions um yeah and yeah i, I definitely one of the most touching presents i got when Carol was born because we got like we got a crazy amount of people sending us things like friends of friends and friends of our donors and stuff and it was really sweet but someone who i knew who's a friend who kind of work stuff, who I know like a little bit and is really nice, um, sent me a book that his kids had really liked. And he just quietly changed the gender in a whole bunch of the paragraph so that the book was um, uh, like perfect for us. And I just thought it was just incredibly sweet. That it's just very nice, very quiet friend, who like mostly a professional friend had done that for us. It was, it was so cute. Um, yeah. Uh, question, how did we, how did you introduce um, the, how do we, how do we introduce the donor friend like as in to other people so. meet them okay um so so your mom calls them the london dads doesn't she yeah which we don't but sometimes it's a useful label because it just captures it um i mean we, we talk about him as our donor but he's also our friend and in terms of how Karis knows them she just kind of knows that they're her people that they're the people who saw her when she was brand new she has pictures of them on her wall she has artwork by our donor's partner on her wall um but she just knows them by the names and um so that's how she refers to them and we haven't had that conversation with her but she's never really asked the question and i think when she does ask the question we'll just just tell her um yeah yeah it's fairly fairly straightforward otherwise we way. just use their names yeah <laughs> um we checked that they were happy about us talking about them today as well so they which they are um yeah if we could just say the names that's fine <laughs> Uh, what were the main factors considering or at the forefront when you made the decision to go down the IVF burner route as opposed to adoption? Um, so we didn't go down IVF as a route. We went down, uh, do it ourselves with donation in jam jar type situation. Um, uh, that's a good question in terms of adoption though. So I, I think probably, so I never wanted to physically have a baby. So that's a question probably more for her than for me. Um, yeah, my, my mother is always reminding me that I didn't want to be a parent. I'm like, no, no, I didn't want to have a baby. 
that's different from being a parent i quite like being a parent but yeah. having a baby is different um i don't know if you want to say a wee bit about Stu. Sort of... i mean i don't you know i i i wanted i wanted to have a baby um that's you know that's the i'm i'm yeah your, your sister has adopted my, kids my who sister, are lovely yeah 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 so that's um um been you know something that um she's had foster children and, and adopted children and continues to have foster children um and and that's wonderful um but i also know how how hard that is um yeah. and so i think at at that time and at this time it's maybe not for us um and but not saying anything about you know yeah the future yeah that's true that's true and i mean i know that it the, the process can be really weird about what's prioritized so it tends to be like they do look at things like the bmi they do look at things like how big is your flat and at the time we were trying to be our flat it was plenty big enough for our family um but it wasn't like huge i mean i've had a like, number we of have, rooms it's, it's funny criteria we that had a large on one bedroom flat that could be converted to a two bedroom we did. but we didn't bother doing that and, until after karis was a year old yeah um, um and and so. i think it was one of those it was a bit like some of the fertility stuff from the nhs it was a bit like you don't poke around other people's kind of child having things first like every, like most most couples are allowed to just go ahead and have a baby however the heck they like um and it felt like you know challenging boundaries and stuff but at the same time like i said heather's Heather got like had really good experience of adopting her kids and um my sister's got a friend who actually made a whole welsh language comedy drama this christmas about his process of adopting his kids um uh which he I, in his case they had someone who was a bit homophobic i think sort of dealing with their case initially and it they were funny funny kind of uh barriers put up about what they did or didn't have in the house to try and make it more difficult and and so we were aware of that as well but it was much more that you wanted to have a baby that was the priority and i think if if we hadn't been successful making a baby then we would have looked at other options and i think we would have looked at adoption at that point but yeah um can Maybe the... um, do you have any tips on navigating the roles of donors and co-parent and the spaces between? My partner knows that they do not want a third co-parent, just to and myself, but I love the idea of a donor being someone we know and our child can have a relationship with, albeit not a parental relationship or of an uncle. Also, is this unfair to ask of our friends as potential donors? It's a really difficult a, to answer question. It's a hard question. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we can really answer that question for you, but I mean, the, the just just be open about it yeah. um is the you know like yeah i mean we we wrote we wrote a long letter um and sent it with some chocolate that was in no way a, a bribe um, <laughs> it was easter it was it was um, it's unintentionally and, very fertility themed easter breasts and yeah. just just you know just being really upfront about um you know what you would like and what you would expect but also open to hearing what they that would like person would like and what they would expect of it yeah. um and you know i mean just from a sort of like we i don't love that they live in london because i'd like to have them closer but that's just you know it's being reality selfish. And geography. <laughs> um but but if you know but if you do have friends who live in Nearby. a different city yeah. um then then it makes it a lot easier to yeah. not have that co-parenting relationship yeah um, it was really nice so... our, our donor was in town for uh, several weeks day recently and was able to pop in and like have dinner and stuff a few times and that was really really nice and it was a bit like oh this would be really nice to be able to do more often um and now because of covid it's been particularly difficult so we were seeing them quite regularly and then covid hit and it's been much harder to get to see them and so i'm really excited that we can see them a lot more often again now that um all of the travel restrictions basically are gone um I, yeah i think it's having an honest conversation i really they, they were really really sweet because we sent this letter and then they sent it's like a text almost immediately going like yes and then they, they had this formal letter as well because they felt like that was important to do which is very sweet um which i have saved away with all kinds of things um and and but they they came they said like can we come up from visit and just sort of talk it through so we literally just had this 
like around the kitchen table they had a list of questions and we talked them through and we were like well we think this but what do you think and then some of the questions like well, what, what, what will child call us and we're like whatever you want to be called is fine with us you know what would you like to be called um and we talked about kind of contact and stuff i think it's really difficult especially when there's a new um and there's a new baby around like it it would be nice if it was possible to have roles for more than two parents in terms of like who gets to take leave and spend time bonding with the baby and it would be really nice if there were kind of more flexibility in the world for that yeah. um and i think our donors would have would have loved that um yeah I, but i think yeah Car caris knows they're her people and how much she's loved by them and and how much i mean we we know how much they love us as well because it's it, that's a huge hugely generous thing to do to help make a baby and and yeah even if you're not co-parenting to be the parents with with your friends in that way um yeah before we both burst into tears <laughs> In a nice well, <laughs> yeah, nice tears are a beautiful way to end any event, I think. Um, this one has been particularly kind of just lovely and warm. It's so nice to, to hear about you and your family and Karis and to briefly see Karis. That was also a treat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks so much for, for that. Um, and thank you for everybody to for coming along and engaging really nicely and asking really interesting questions. I feel like we could carry on talking for at least another, well, I could carry on listening to you talk for at least another several hours. But um, we do, I mean, some of us have children to parent. Um, <laughs> that <I> have, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, some of us don't have multiple grandparents. <laughs> um, and I have a cat to feed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, thanks very, very, very much for joining us on this Ida Hobbit. Um, and for sharing your experiences and your stories. Um, it was a real pleasure and thanks very much to the audience for joining us this evening as well. <laughs>